This man believes he's losing his mind. I force myself to stay awake at night. He has violent sex with his partner whilst in deep sleep, but has no memory of what he does. I don't think that I'm any different from any rapist that goes out there and commits that act. It's like a dirty secret. He's locked in the terrifying world of sexomnia. Sexomnia is a behavior that occurs in sleep. If someone has sexomnia, then they are a risk to others. He's embarking on tests to analyze his nocturnal behavior. I'm normally quite a soft, placid person, but when I'm asleep, I'm totally the opposite. A new sleep sex condition is challenging the medical profession. At this point in time, we have no real idea how common or rare a phenomenon this is, because it's new. I don't know what I'm capable of. This film contains strong sexual scenes. We all sleep, and most of us have sex, but some of us have sex while we're sleeping, although we appear to be wide awake. This condition is called sexomnia, or sleep sex. Little is known about this mysterious phenomenon, but for some, the shadowy world of sexomnia is a dark and fearful place. I woke up to find he had pushed my legs apart. He was trying to have sex with me. I tried to fight him off, but he was too strong for me, so he just took what he wanted. It's the most frightful thing that's ever happened to me, and I never really understood fear until... did happen to me. I'm afraid it'll never be cured. I'm afraid that if it doesn't get cured that my husband won't be able to deal with it much longer. Sleep sex or sexomnia uh, refers to sex or sexual behaviors occurring during a state of sleep. Sexomnia is very simply a parasomnia which means it's a funny thing that happens during sleep in which a person has sexual behaviors that would normally be associated with wakefulness. The behaviors that occur in a sexomnia episode varies from touching to fondling to uh, groping to full penetrative sex and also includes things like masturbation. Sexomnia strikes randomly. Because it's only newly identified medically and because it's so difficult to speak about, no one knows how many suffer from this condition. George and Anne have asked to remain anonymous. George is 38 years old and outwardly healthy. He and Anne had been in a happy relationship for two years. I love you. I love you too. Until one night, four months ago, something happened. It all started a few months ago. I went to bed as usual. I usually go to bed before him. After a while, I fell asleep. I was woken up by him pushing against me. He wasn't saying anything. He was just trying to have sex with me. I told him I didn't feel like it, that I wasn't enjoying it. He carried on. I remember asking him to stop, but he didn't. In the morning, I asked him if he could remember having sex, and he just said no. He dismissed it. I just thought that because he'd been in such a deep sleep, before and after, that he'd just forgotten, so I didn't push it. How could anyone have sex without knowing about it? 
On the rare occasion that I have been drunk and had sex, I've still remembered. So how could I not have any alcohol intake, have sex, but not remember? It happened again two weeks later. It ended up with him forcing himself on me and having sex with me in various ways. I tried to shake him awake, to get him to hear me. When I tried to push him off, he got aggressive with me. He's quite strong. When this happens, he seems to get more strength and become even stronger. So I stop because I don't know how far I can push it before he might actually get violent with me. It's not that I'm scared of him. I'm scared of what might happen if I resist him. George maintained that he couldn't remember a thing and even questioned the truth of what she was saying. So Anne started to keep a diary of these nightmarish encounters. This is what I wrote from the 18th of July. I woke up with him squeezing my breasts and parting my legs. He was being really rough. I asked him to stop and he took no notice. He asked me to do what I normally do when he's feeling like that, but I said I couldn't because of the time of the month. He said we should get someone to stand in for me when this happened because he needs to be taken care of. Then he turned his back on me. But George ignored Anne's written accounts. I was a little bit selfish because I didn't want to talk about it. Because I didn't want to deal with the fact that I wasn't in control of something. That I wasn't in control of myself. But Anne just carried on recording these hellish experiences, hoping that somehow the information could help them both. The 29th of August. I woke up during the night in pain. He was pinning me down with his body. I tried to push him off, but he put his hands around my neck, and that, combined with his body weight, meant I couldn't breathe. I pinned her down on the stomach. Apparently, I had my hands going underneath her and then around the front of her neck, around a windpipe. I don't know why, but I relaxed and went along with it, and he released his grip. I still wanted to dismiss it, but I couldn't dismiss it because I knew she wouldn't be making it up. Finally, four months on, George is facing up to the horrifying fact that Anne is telling the truth. The worst thing is the guilt. The fear of not being in control. The fear of what I could do to someone that I love. I don't think, apart from the fact that I'm asleep, that I'm any different from any rapist that goes out there and commits that act. It's still non-consensual sex. I can't allow myself to relax when anyone's around me. Especially at night. Because I don't want to hurt anyone. The one thing that I've always felt is that I'm going crazy. And I feel like I'm losing my mind. George no longer sleeps at night. Anne sleeps alone. Their relationship is at breaking point. They're to travel to Edinburgh for tests that will establish exactly what happens to George mentally and physically during sleep. He must find a cure. For some, the line between sleeping and waking is blurred. This is the mysterious world of sexomnia. Sufferers initiate sex in their sleep and have no memory of their actions. It's make or break time for George and Anne. For the last four months, George has been forcing her to have sex with him in his sleep, and the episodes are becoming increasingly violent. Yet George has no memory of what's been taking place. They're enlisting the help of top sleep specialist, Dr. Ishad Ibrahim. People with sexomnia, like sleepwalkers, usually have amnesia for these episodes of sexual behavior. So it is not surprising that they do not believe their bed partners when their bed partners report that they've actually had sex. We've had bed partners coming in who have been physically injured with bruises after experiencing an episode of sexomnia. Dr. Ibrahim recommends that George and Anne travel to the Edinburgh Sleep Center 
where George's sleep patterns can be analyzed for the first time. The results will determine whether a sleep disorder is at the heart of his behavior. At the sleep center, George will be monitored all night. Though terrified of the tests, he's desperate for answers. Meanwhile, Anne marks time. Without answers, she knows their relationship can't carry on. Neither has any idea what the future holds. I don't really have a fear of losing my partner in terms of splitting up. But I do have a fear of losing her in other ways, which is by my hand. I just don't know what I'm capable of. That's the biggest fear. Sleep center technician, Lizzie Hill, prepares George for the tests. She'll be monitoring George over a period of eight hours to find out if he shows any signs of parasomnia or abnormal sleep. Sensors attached to George's head will record any brain activity while he's sleeping. What they're actually picking up is electrical activity from the brain. Although it's a very small amount, it can be picked up by these wires. It'll travel through the wires It'll go into a box which will amplify the signal so that we can read them on the computer. Body sensors will record George's heartbeat, breathing and limb movements. George is now wearing 19 sensors on every part of his body. That's great, I'll thread these around the back there. It's time for George to settle down and sleep. Lizzie will monitor his brain waves for any strange happenings during the night. Right, so that's five minutes in and he's already asleep. You can see that the, the waves here have started to slow down. So it looks like he's settled and asleep already and that's only five minutes, so a good start, a good start. There's still this little voice inside that keeps on asking, what if? What if everything comes back inconclusive? What then? Those are the questions that I'm trying not to answer now because I don't know the answer and I don't really think I want to know. He's starting to move into the deeper stages of sleep now and that's only 20 minutes into the study so fairly quick. You can see here there's much slower, bigger waves, which is where it gets the name slow wave sleep from. George has passed into deep sleep quickly. Lizzie is now looking for anything abnormal in his brainwave pattern. We're still seeing these slow waves here, nice slow waves. No leg movements and very regular breathing. Suddenly something happens. George appears to have woken up. Ah, there we go. So this is an arousal. This is exactly the sort of thing that we're looking for. Um, you can see the, quite clearly there that the, you've got these big slow waves. The waves become faster, darker, and this rise in muscle tone as well. And then that's him back off to sleep. So that's the sort of about 15 seconds worth of the brain waking up, then going back to sleep. As the next hour passes, Lizzie monitors a further 14 arousals. Ah, and here you can see there's a change, and this looks like a, a bigger awakening. And you can see he's moving about slightly. A bigger awakening here again. That's a very brief arousal. Although George appears to be awake during the arousals, only part of his brain is alert. The rest of him is still deeply asleep. It's now four in the morning. Lizzie is halfway through the eight-hour session. She's intrigued to know what sleep patterns will emerge as George enters the next phase of the night. Sexomnia is a new phenomenon. As well as helping him personally, the outcome of George's tests will provide important data for the developing medical understanding of sleep. 
The current understanding of sexomnia is that it is part of sleepwalking. It is one manifest behavior that is exhibited as part of a sleepwalking episode. We can do almost anything during a sleepwalking episode that we can do during wakefulness. The significant difference is that we are not conscious of our behaviors at the time. Our behaviors are driven from the deep parts of the brain, but we do not have any executive function during sleepwalking episodes. So we can see, we can hear, we can feel, we can perform complex motor tasks, but we are not aware of doing it at the time. Sexomnia can result in all kinds of unwanted and violent sex, sometimes against strangers. In 2002, sexomnia as a condition was barely known. Ben had been initiating sex in his sleep for years. Ben is not his real name, and he must remain anonymous. It always just been sort of a normal part of my relationships with girlfriends. Sort of a bizarre novelty, if you will. But this harmless novelty was to wreak havoc. I was at a party and I woke up on a couch with somebody I didn't know. Like everyone else at the party, Ben had been drinking. Ben remembers that he wandered into one of the living rooms where a woman he didn't know had fallen asleep on the sofa. He crashed out at the other end of it. Ben has no memory of what happened next. But it was, in short, a catastrophe. The woman suddenly awoke to find a stranger not only on top of her, but having sex with her. She managed to push him off. They then both left the party separately. Later that night, Ben went to the bathroom and discovered he was wearing a condom. The following day, he heard that a sexual assault had taken place. The mystery sleeping woman had gone to the police. She was unable to identify her attacker, but Ben, knowing that he had a history of sexomnia, guessed that he must have been the perpetrator. I contacted the police in the morning, and it turned out there had been a, a complaint, a sexual assault a complaint, and my whole world was just sort of thrown into a complete tailspin. She pressed charges. Ben ended up in court. I went from a completely normal life, uh, you know, having a great business, uh, perfect health, into, you know, complete, utter turmoil, legal battles, um, back problems. Uh, I became suicidal for a better part of a year. My hair started going gray within three weeks of the event. Um, I looked in the mirror one morning and thought, Jesus, Murphy, I'm going gray. Like it was, a, it was the most frightful thing that's ever happened to me. And I never really understood fear until it did happen to me. With the hearing upon him, Ben would now have to find a defense for what had happened at the party and for an act that he couldn't remember. Nick Morgan from London also has sexomnia, but his experience of it is different. Past girlfriends have told him that they had sex during the night, but he has no recollection. Well, I'm 26 now. The initial sleep sex started about four years ago. One morning I woke up and uh, my girlfriend turned around to me and said, look, you know, you're getting quite fruity about three, four o'clock this morning. Um, and I just had no idea. For the first sort of six months, she actually thought I was awake. You know, I was sort of woken up in the middle of the night, felt horny and, um, you know, decided that I, I wanted a bit. <laughs> so, for want of a better word. <laughs> One night, we'd gone to sleep, absolutely fine, um, no problem at all. Um, and I actually woke up um, halfway through the act. You know, I looked down and I realised, you know, what was happening. Um, 
And uh, my girlfriend at the time was, was actually sort of full swing into it, we, well we both were. So it was then that I realised that I did have um, some type of, uh, of sleep disorder. She thought it was fine and we'd have our sex before we went to sleep and then she'd get second a little bit later. <laughs> um, unfortunately, because I couldn't remember it, I was sort of like the losing party on that one. Unlike other sufferers, Nick's sexomnia hasn't led to aggressive sex. I suppose it's a bit of a novel chat-up line actually. I think quite recently I went out with a, a girl and I said, look, you know, I've got this sleep disorder. She said, well, how do you mean? I said, well, I've got sexomnia. She said, well, what's sexomnia? I said, well, it's like sleepwalking, but not. So I interpret that how you want. And she was a little bit like, not too sure how to take this, but the more I explained it, the more she suddenly sort of came on and thought, that's actually not a bad thing, to be honest. You know, if you're um, waking up and getting seconds in the middle of the night, then uh, yeah, it definitely works. Fortunately for Nick, his sleep sex persona is likable. It's quite gentle to start with, um, a lot of touching, um, and yeah, there's a lot of kissing there as well. Um, and then it just sort of escalates and obviously becomes a full-blown act. Pretty much everything is exactly as it would be as if we were awake. Um, the only difference is I can't remember it. Obviously I'm asleep. <laughs> when we used to joke about it, when we used to have nicknames for it and everything, it started off with sleep shagging, and then it was um, midnight mitten invasions. Now, at the end of the day, I don't really see it as a sleep disorder. Now, the girls that I've experienced it with um, have all actually looked at the lighter side of it, and um, in a way, it has been a, an added bonus to our sex life. Ben had been having sleep sex for 15 years without any problem. I'd say the first real recollection of it would be um, probably when I was 20, 21, at uh, university. It always just been sort of a normal part of my relationships with with girlfriends, long-term girlfriends, you know, we'd, either if we went out for a few drinks or went out for dinner, came home, had sex and passed out and woke up in the middle of the night having sex again, I mean, it was no big deal. But now Ben was up in court on a sexual assault charge brought by a woman he had sex with at a party, an act he could not remember. His innocence was dependent on whether the defence could prove that this event was a sleep sex episode that Ben was a sexomniac, and therefore not responsible for his actions. He was assessed by top sleep expert, Dr Shapiro. I had the opportunity to interview and um, took the history, as one would do in a person with any sleep disorder, and came to the conclusion that the most likely explanation of his situation was that he had a parasomnia, and particularly a sexomnia, on the occasion when he was accused of uh, having an inappropriate sexual interaction with a woman at a party. And went in for polysomnographic uh, testing, uh, which I went in and slept two nights at a, a sleep study, sleep lab, and um, did other sort of various tests um, to determine that I had a, a non-REM sleepwalking disorder. I'm completely sure that this was not in any way an inappropriate sexual behavior. It was an inappropriate sleep behavior which happened to take a sexual form. Dr. Shapiro's assessment of his condition was a breakthrough for Ben. But how would the judge respond to this evidence? Nick knows he has sex omnia and feels he's in control of the condition. It did worry me at first because I thought that it might escalate. It's been going on for, for three to four years now and um, it's always been the same. If the, the person that I'm with isn't interested then uh, you know they sort of gently push me away and I go back to sleep. I'm going out tonight, so uh, doing a little bit of shopping before we go. I want to look good for, uh, for getting down the club. And yeah, that'll be perfect. Got quite a healthy sex life. 
I have had um, sort of quite a few sexual partners recently. Each one of those has been quite a quite a healthy sexual relationship. I mean, it could happen four nights out of five. Um, it could happen one night out of five. Um, so usually, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a lottery, really, a bit of a gamble whether it is going to happen. Despite the frequency of Nick's sleep sex episodes, they're unpredictable. Well, it only happens with um, people that I'm actually having a, a sexual relationship with at the time. Um, it's never happened with anyone that I, I haven't been having sex with. Um, one of the girls that lives in the flat, actually, for the first three weeks that she lived here, we actually slept in the same bed together, um, and uh, it didn't, didn't happen at all, it didn't manifest itself at all. Initially, when I first found out um, about sleep sex, um, it did worry me, I've got to say. Um, you know, you sort of hear these horror stories about people waking up and, and you know, sleepwalking, going into someone else's room. Um, it's, it's never actually happened with me. But Nick has read about the dangers of sexomnia, including Ben's case. It does worry you because, you know, you, you suddenly think to yourself, well, you know, potentially I could be in that position, you know, and <laughs> there's nothing in my nature, there's nothing that I've ever done which would, you know, even remotely put me in that position. Um, but to find out that it could happen when I'm asleep, when I've got no control over it, is obviously, you know, I mean, that's, that's quite a scary, um, quite a scary thing, really. Ben was enduring a court case that was one of the first of its kind. The defence did not dispute the fact that a sexual act had taken place, but they argued that Ben was not in control of his actions. It would be for the judge to decide. George has no control over his sexomnia. He's been having increasingly violent sex with his partner, Anne, against her will. He performs these acts whilst in deep sleep and has no recollection of them in the morning. Anne is in great danger. The couple have come to the Edinburgh Sleep Centre, where George is being tested for abnormal sleep patterns. While George is asleep, it's Anne's turn to stay awake. Their relationship hangs in the balance. I do love him with all my heart. And if I didn't, I would have left a long time ago because I would have put my own feelings before his. It's now 4 a.m. and George is halfway through the night. Sleep center technician Lizzie Hill is observing George's sleep behavior. She's picking up dramatic disturbances in George's brainwave patterns. The graph is showing that a part of his brain is waking up during sleep. In, in a patient who, who has some sort of parasomnia, we would expect to see these arousals or awakenings from slow wave sleep. We have an arousal out of this very deep stage of sleep into a sleepwalking episode or into a sexomnia episode. Even if we don't see a sort of full-blown sleepwalking event or night terror event, having these arousals during slow wave is a good indicator of parasomnia and we're looking for those to decide whether this is something that we can treat. At 7.30 a.m., George wakes up. The test is over. He's passed a long and fitful night, and his many arousals from sleep have been recorded. Lizzie's findings will now be analyzed by Dr. Ibrahim. George has no memory of what occurred during the sleep test. He and Anne must wait 48 hours to meet with Dr. Ibrahim for the results. Ben's court case had begun in November 2003. His lawyer now had medical evidence to help his case. The sleep specialist I was referred to testified for me in court, gave uh, expert witness. He was a sleepwalker. He had had previous uh, sexomnia experiences with other partners, notably a girlfriend in Italy, uh, and he had family members who were parasomniacs. As well as researching his sleep history, Dr. Shapiro also looked for factors that could have triggered a parasomnia in Ben that night. In terms of the events immediately prior, uh, he was unusually sleepy and that was documented and he had been uh, short on sleep uh, because of his work, which was highly physical. Um, it was a party where people had stayed up late. Um, there had been alcohol consumption, which no one denied. And uh, so those were the triggering factors. After two and a half years in the courts, 
the judge finally delivered his verdict. I was acquitted. As I was acquitted of the sexual assault charge, I just started broke down, crying in the courtroom. Um, and then I was also acquitted of the mental disorder, which could have had some pretty serious ramifications for my life as well. And when I was finally acquitted of the, the mental disorder, then you know, I just sort of fell apart. If people aren't aware of what they're doing, they're not responsible for their actions. Without going into too much detail, she was the one who told the police that it was as if she'd woken me out of a deep sleep. Ben was acquitted two years ago and is rebuilding his life around his condition. It was a very intimidating thing to have on your shoulder going into a relationship or your you know, even having a sexual relationship with somebody. I mean, it was something that I had to introduce right off the bat. Until you've really been through court experience, you'd understand what it's like to be prosecuted by a Crown attorney. That's sort of where the whole sort of nonchalantness of it all turned ugly and turned into a hurricane of fear and pain and anguish. The range of behaviours in people who have sexomnia is very varied. It includes masturbation, which is a recognised form of sexomnia. The sufferer lives a normal life during the day, but loses all control whilst asleep at night. Uh, basically, at night, when I am asleep, uh, I pleasure myself sometimes all night long. Sleep masturbation is a form of sleep sex. 